Welcome back to another Naval News video. I'd like to thank Established Titles for sponsoring today's video. Today we're going to talk about the island of Guam. That is a little piece of land about 30 miles wide that is 3,000 miles west of the Hawaiian island chain and over 1,000 miles east of the Philippine Islands. It's out there in the Western Pacific and is absolutely vital to America's security and forces in that region of the world. Let's begin with... Uh, March 21st of this year, whenever we had uh, the USS Springfield was relocated, move of home port to, uh, to Guam itself, uh, bringing the number of submarines stationed permanently out of Guam up to five, five total. That is a, that is a huge amount of capability that is very near the Asian theater, whether it be the East China Sea or the South China Sea, these submarines can get there rapidly. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the video. But what is happening on the island of Guam right now, and has been kind of going on for a few years, is a lot of construction activity. We are really doubling down and reinforcing on what Guam's capabilities are in terms of shore support and housing of troops and the ability to um, support the Air Force on the Air Force side of the base, that's increasing, as well as the Navy waterfront. Uh, Admiral Joblin, who is the U.S. submarine uh, admiral over in the island in that region, says this is part of a 10-year program to reinforce the island of Guam in what he calls uh, the decade of danger with China, because China uh, is coming to a head. They're increasing their capability. They outnumber us a number of ships, whether it's in the East China Sea or the South China Sea, they simply have more. And he sees these uh, upgrades as absolutely essential. So you can see here, we're building a lot of new facilities using the CBs as well as civilian contractors on the island. And on the north part of the island, we also have this expeditionary medical facility that was established there by request. So they're already getting ready to uh, be able to sustain a mass casualty situation should that be required. And on the Air Force side of things, they've been very busy over there building reinforced structures like this hangar that you see here and many other buildings that uh, there aren't public photographs of. But we do have this aerial shot of just before the construction began, I assure you the number of buildings on this island has increased since this shot has been taken. Uh, but this is, this is the last you know, public domain image of the island of Guam. We are heavily reinforcing Guam right now with a whole new um, troop of, of Marines building barracks for them. We're moving them off the Okinawa Island onto the Guam Island, increasing their presence here. The Air Force Base and the Naval Base uh, and the Joint Base between them are all being expanded and reinforced, as well as establishing new uh, at-sea commands out of Guam. So a lot's going on over there. Now, we're going to talk about a new capability that our submarine force has that is finally public and we can talk about it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thank you to Established Titles for sponsoring this video. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to preserve natural woodlands of Scotland as well as support a global reforestation effort. Through Established Titles, you can purchase symbolic souvenir plots of land for yourself or as a great gift. This project is based on historic Scottish tradition where landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. You can officially include the title of lord or lady on credit cards, plane tickets, and dating profiles. And having that title on your dating profile is a great way to break the ice on your first date. Each title pack gives you at least one square foot of land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. Established Titles works with global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to plant a tree with every order. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack with my link will effectively be next to my plot. It's within walking distance. We can start a sub-brief kingdom. It makes an amazing last minute gift. Apparently, you're so interested in Scotland. Why did you do that? <laughs> Established Titles is running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use my code SUB, you get an additional 10% off. So go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash SUB and get your gifts now and help support the channel. All right, welcome back. Um, I was very privileged in my very first command in the United States Navy to be part of a development squadron where we got the opportunity to test new gear and equipment. And one of the many things that were tested on board uh, 
submarines on the squadron that I was in uh, was tethered unmanned underwater vehicles in the early 1990s. And it was a really exciting time. Uh, they had to basically rip apart a lot of the torpedo room to put on the, all this new equipment in and try and operate these uh, rovers, is what we called them back then, around the submarine. And uh, that program never stopped. It continued all the way till today. And today we're going to talk about the Razorback program. This is just one of many unmanned underwater vehicles that are in the Navy's development pipeline right now. But this one has finally come uh, in, into service. Uh, for the submarine force. It's been around for a little while. Here you can see some tests that are being done with a small boat and, so, and a dive team recovering it in uh, 2016. This is a 600 pound drone in this configuration, which puts it into the medium unmanned underwater vehicle class. We have a little bit closer image of what it looks like here. Here you can see um, you know, the nose cone where the tether wire and communication wire fit into. You get an idea of the size of the thing too as they have it up on the small craft now. And the man is communicating with it with his little uh, computer there, you know, either giving it, you know, autonomous directions that it will follow once it's deployed or downloading the data that it recorded, because these things can be used in a whole different uh, a wide variety rather of roles, whether it's mine detection, swimmer detection, submarine detection. Uh, they are really great sensors. Some part of the drawback, though, is that the thing is kind of big. Look, look at the thing. Look at the size of it. So up until now, we've been limited in how we deploy and retrieve the Razorback. And one of the requirements was you needed to have the mobile dry dock installed on your submarine and a team of divers to help retrieve it in order to employ the thing. And that greatly limited the practicality of using this mobile sensor. But here you can see some images of, of what that's, those operations are like, being submerged, deploying and retrieving with a team of divers. And as you can imagine, it's a noisy evolution as well, so you're not exactly being stealthy as you're doing this. Well, all that has changed now. But now we have the Razorback 2. The Razorback 2 is a modified Razorback that fits in a 53-centimeter torpedo tube, which means it can be used by almost any submarine in the world, whether it's a NATO, uh, Japan, Australia, of course, the United States. If you have a 53 centimeter torpedo, this new modified Razorback will fit. This unmanned underwater vehicle will fit in your torpedo tube and can be launched. And what is incredible about it is that not only is it autonomous and untethered, it can be retrieved while you're moving forward through the water. It can find its way back to the torpedo tube and dock itself in the torpedo tube. This is a huge leap forward in capability for unmanned underwater vehicles. The way that the Navy says that they're gonna employ these is to use the submarine as a mothership for the UUVs and put out a field of UUVs around itself so they can greatly increase the distance that it can locate things through sonar and other means, other detection means as well, and communicate. The submarine no longer has to go too shallow to the surface to communicate. It can do it from just about any depth. The uh, Admiral, Admiral Doug Perry, which is the director of submarine warfare, says, we have this system working now. And that's huge. If this system works today, it won't be long before it's in the fleet. And having this capability on American submarines couldn't come at a better time because the demand on the United States submarine force is increasing as we're decommissioning a lot of ships and some submarines as well, uh, putting the ratio of submarines to, uh, to surface ships um, heavier on the submarine side. And in a potential, you know, peer adversary uh, conflict coming up on the horizon, uh, this these sensors could make a big difference. So this uh, system is called the Razorback 2 or Razorback Modified. I imagine they'll come up with their own name for it. And it is a torpedo tube launched, completely untethered and autonomous mobile drone that can act as a sensor or other jobs that are unspecified. I assume they mean like mine detection, but uh, un unspecified things. And according to Admiral Perry, these will be in service fleet-wide very soon. Of course, he didn't give us an exact date, but this is an incredible new technology. So congratulations on the United States Navy of making this come true. Whenever I first saw the beginnings of this way back in the early 1990s, I didn't think it would actually be, you know, operational in my lifetime. But as I sit here making this recording, I am, you know, astonished that they pulled it off, apparently. 
So we can look forward to having these deployed with our submarines uh, very soon, according to the Director of Submarines for the Chief of Naval Operations. Yeah, this is a great day for the Navy. Congratulations to all the submariners out there. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.